Uh, it's a sad day because we have to say goodbye to Caitlin Cox, who is right here and has come up to the front. <laughs> Caitlin was our scholarship intern this year. She's a student at SUNY Fredonia, and we've been very lucky to have her this year, and unfortunately, today is her last day. So, good luck, Caitlin. If you wish a recording of this lecture or any of the Heritage lectures, a recording that is just an audio, please see this man over here, Dennis Galecki, and he will put you in touch with the link. These are not recorded by the institution, these are recorded by CSON and put on their website. Well, today, VJ Day, it's called VJ Day, it's called, uh, in the US, that's what we call it, in Australia, New Zealand, it's called VP Day, which in many ways makes more sense than you had a, you didn't call it VG Day, Victory in Europe, Victory in the Pacific, and anyway, we call it VJ Day, and in Japan, it's called Memorial Day. Now, there are three VJ Days. There's August 14th, August 15th, and do you know when we celebrate it in the United States? September 2nd is actually VJ Day here. <clears throat> the reason for that is that uh, it was August 15th in Japan when they surrendered, but it was still August 14th in the United States, and it was on August 14th, 70 years ago, that Harry Truman made the announcement at 7 o'clock at night that the war had ended. But in the UK, they celebrate VJ on August 15th. And other places, August 14th, and we do it August 2nd, because of course that's when the peace treaty was signed aboard the Missouri. And Truman announced that on the 14th. He said that it would not be VJ Day until the treaty was actually signed. But the world was already celebrating the end of the war uh, by, before August 14th. After the dropping of the second bomb in Nagasaki on August 9th, Japan, the following day, offered its terms of surrender. So people knew that the war was, in fact, winding down, and they began celebrating around the world on Wednesday. So celebrations were already in effect, actually, when the announcement on the 14th uh, was made. Well, we're going to begin with a clip provided by Greg Peterson at the Robert Jackson Center to introduce the subject of VJ Day. On August 6, 1945, Truman gave the go-ahead to drop an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Few Americans had any idea what an atomic bomb was, but clearly it was some sort of super weapon. Three days later, a second one was detonated, this time over Nagasaki. From the initial newsroom in New York, San Francisco, the International News Service, FCC quotes Domai saying Japan accepts allied terms. Repeating this bulletin, dated San Francisco, the Federal <laughs> Communication Commission quotes <laughs> Domai saying Japan accepts allied terms. This is not official. I repeat, this is not official. This is from the Tokyo Radio. We have another bulletin here. Japan surrenders. Japan surrenders. Now repeating the entire bulletin, the Japanese government has accepted the Allied Surrender Formula. I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places I am racing all day through in that small cafe the path across the way the children's carousel the chestnut the wishing well I'll be seeing you In every lovely summer's day 
in everything that's life and game. I'll always think of you that way. I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. I'll be seeing you, I'll be seeing you. On a uh, strategic level, this meant that there hadn't been the degree of destruction that there would have been of Japan although a lot had already been, uh, had, had, had occurred already, still it was somewhat easier to begin the task of uh, rebuilding. On a uh, diplomatic and strategic level, uh, it kept the Soviets out of uh, the business of rebuilding Japan and uh, playing a much more active role in the reconstruction of the post-war Pacific. They did declare war uh, with the dropping of the second bomb on Nagasaki, but we're never involved in the war and such. We're never really allowed to take part much in the peace process as well. But perhaps most of all, on a human level, it was a, a tremendous relief to end the war without the, the casualties and suffering that was anticipated. Um, it was a relief for those who were in the services in the Pacific. It was a relief for those from Europe on their way to the Pacific, like my dad was. Uh, and it was also a relief for the families of those who were serving. To tell us a bit about how the news struck here at Chautauqua, let's ask David Zinman now to come up. 13 years old, uh, and I was a uh, copy boy on the Chautauqua Daily. I knew I wanted to be a newspaper man, and I was hanging out in the Colonnade building that night because they had a United Press teletype machine. And I was with my pal. So closer. Closer? Is this better? Yeah. I, was with my, I was with my pal, Jim Fox, who was uh, also uh, interested in becoming a newspaper man, and he eventually worked for the Dunkirk Observer. So uh, we were uh, in the Colonnade building, and all of a sudden, we heard Six bells. Now, a bulletin is four bells. Six bells? I'd never heard that before. Well, there is, so, uh, there is a news story that takes precedence over a bulletin it, at that time. It was called The Flash, which usually only two words. So we ran over and looked at the teletype, and the two words were, Japan surrenders. And we looked at each other, I said, my God, Jim, that means the war is over because Germany had already uh, surrendered in the, the earlier that year. Well, old first night was going on in the amphitheater, and it was a huge celebration. And it, it is today, but it was even bigger then. And this, the uh, symphony orchestra was on the stage. Ralph McAllister was at the microphone. He was the mighty Mercury of the day at that time. I said, you know, Jim, nobody knows about this but us, the two of us. All those parents out there, you know, at that time they thought that in the invasion of Japan we would lose 100,000 lives. That was a projection. I said, all those parents with kids over there, they won't know about this tomorrow till they turn on the radio. There was no television then. Why don't we uh, go over and tell them? Bring the news to the amphitheater where everybody is tonight. So he says, great idea, and he starts running. And I start running and I said, wait a minute. And I run back and I tear off the flash. Now he's ahead of me and he's running down the past the plaza, uh, past the post office, past the uh, library, he's down the red brick wall, walk down the ramp. And he's shouting as he goes down, and people are looking at him, because we were all dressed in rough clothes and so forth. And Mr. McAllister, who was at the microphone, called over a signal for a security man to come over. <laughs> so Jim 
runs up to the microphone and starts trying to tell Mr. McAllister what the news is. He was totally out of breath. He was going, <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't get it out. And now here comes me. I come across the red brick wall, down the ramp, running down, and I'm right behind him, and I can't talk either. I'm totally out of breath, and there we are, standing in front of him, a couple of security men coming over, and I remember, I have the flash, and I reach behind me, and I hold up the flash. Mr. McAllister looks at me very strangely, but he reaches down, picks it up, reads it, and his whole expression changes. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the most momentous announcement. Japan has surrendered. World War II is over. It was like 18 cannons went up in the amphitheater. People stood and grabbed whoever was next to them and hugged and kissed them, danced around. There was a soldier in the first row who was dancing around. And then Mr. McAllister saw the conductor and gave him a nod. And Franco Ottori, who was then the conductor, raised his baton. The orchestra knew what he meant. And they played the Star Spangled Banner. And that's how the news of the end of World War II was brought to Chicago. So that's how World War II ended. It was a world war. Soldiers fighting both in the Pacific and coming back from Europe. As I said, it was a great relief for those who were just passing through on their way to the Pacific. I'd like now to ask Greg Peterson from the Robert Jackson Center to come up and to introduce an interview he did with one of those men, Bud Horn. That's the easy part, is the interview. Man, I see a lot of folks here, and I'm not going to lose an opportunity to talk a little bit about the bookend of World War II, which in fact was the Nuremberg Trial. The Nuremberg Trial was a, the architect of the trial was Robert Jackson, an individual from Chautauqua County, an individual who spoke here frequently at Chautauqua Institution. And in fact, during this time period, I had a chance to talk a little bit earlier this today at the Men's Club, that during this particular week is an interesting week. We all know, because you saw the, the, the piece about what just occurred at uh, Hiroshima. And then shortly thereafter, on the 9th, was Nagasaki. Little known, but at the day before we actually had David Zinman get the teletype and the flash, was in fact a significant bombing of Japan. In fact, today, there was a, uh, a little email blast that came around that on August 14th, not to be confused with August 15th, uh, there was a situation where during the period of time where after Nagasaki there was conversation going on within the Duma regarding terms of surrender. As it turned out, we were getting all of their information, all of the intelligence that was going on. We had broken the code. We knew what was going on here in the United States. So from the 10th until really the 14th, we, we stopped our bombing, hoping that they were going to give us what we had sought, the unconditional surrender. Well, that didn't happen. In fact, there were conditions they were talking about. So impatient on the 14th, the situation was not clear, and the U.S. bombing missions resumed. I didn't know this. And on the 14th, 1,014 bombers hit the Japanese mainland, the largest raid in the Pacific Theater. That was occurring literally the day before the unconditional surrender. So that's just a lot was going on. But during this time period, and lost literally into the dustbin of history, is in fact, uh, a treaty that was known as the London Agreement. London Agreement was in fact 
a, an agreement among the Allies to conduct war crimes trials against the perpetrators of those of the Axis powers. And for six months, or six weeks prior, Robert Jackson, a guy from here, who never went to college, never graduated from law school, who is the answer to the Jeopardy question, and the only person who is a Justice of the Supreme Court, Solicitor General, and Attorney General, did in fact, was the architect and the negotiator of that particular treaty, and in fact, was the signatory for the United States of America. That's cool, and that occurred on August 8th. So again, when you look at the timeline, you got Hiroshima, you got this in London, which is in fact the war crimes trial, you have uh, uh, Nagasaki, you have these raids, and then you have capitulation. And shortly thereafter, the commencement of the Nuremberg trial. I'm not here to talk a lot about the Nuremberg trial, but one of the things we've been doing at the Robert H. Jackson Center is in fact pausing to reflect and to salute those individuals, and I'm sure there are many here, who were part of the greatest generation, the uh, folks who are, we call them as our defenders of freedom. And one of them we had a chance to interview at an event at Chicago was Bud Horn, right here. And I thought we'd pause, and we have a nine-minute clip of, of vignettes of that interview, which will give you a sense of his experiences during World War II. Slave labor camp at Nordhausen, liberated by the 3rd Armored Division, 1st Army. At least 3,000 political prisoners died here at the brutal hands of SS troops and pardoned German criminals who were the camp guards. Nordhausen had been a depository for slaves found unfit for work in the underground V-bomb plants and in other German camps and factories. Then the actual burial in common graves of the 2,500 Nordhausen victims. Is that hard to watch? Yep. We rode in on the tanks. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the armored, armored. We were on the tanks. That's how we got there. Yeah. Did you know what you were going to be heading towards? Did they give you any sense? No. We, we, <coughs> no. we just wandered in and saw what, what was going on, yeah. S saw what you, what you just saw. So you were there early on? Yeah, yeah. What was, the, what was the reaction among your, your fellow troop members? Well, it, was, it was hard to believe. Deations in, mm -hmm. in, in bodies and in piles. Yeah. Uh, there had to be some real sense of revulsion of this. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it was. Although we'd seen dead people before, they say it wasn't as though we weren't used to seeing corpses. Right. So it, perhaps for us it was not quite as shocking as it might have been for civilians or, mm -hmm. or others from the... Were the Germans still there? Were there people? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. They had they they as you saw in the movie they had the Germans come in and and dig the the trenches to to and 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 load the corpses into the trenches and cover them up. That was the citizens, but also the soldiers. Had they had left by then? Oh yeah, they'd left. Uh, yeah, they just took off. Graduated from high school in '43. Went in in in. Uh, uh, went in that summer and went to Princeton from uh, January to March. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the, that program was, uh, we were studying basic engineering at Princeton. We, we, were in our, we were in our uniforms. We had been, uh, we'd had basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, infantry basic training, which was pretty rugged because most of the non-coms were washout from the OCS program at Fort Benning. So they kind of taken a, taking these college boys and tried to teach them a lesson. So, but. And uh, then um, that program folded. They decided they didn't need engineers. They needed infantry. We got sent out to Camp Carson, Colorado, where we joined the 104th <laughs> Timberwolf Division. Commanding General was terrible ter Terry Allen, who along with uh, James Roosevelt was in the 1st Division in Africa, and he, he was pretty outspoken. He got into trouble with the brass, so he got 
pushed here, hither and yon along with Roosevelt. But uh, he became our, he came back to the States to, to form this division. At first we landed at Cherbourg on a, a converted, the George Washington, a converted uh, luxury liner. We had six tiers of bunks and we, we slept in shifts and ate in shifts, saltwater showers. Uh, we slept, we were on deck while the rest were down below and then, then we'd go down below and they'd come up on deck. We landed at Cherbourg, which was the first port uh, directly, we came directly to, the, to that port without stopping in England. We were the first convoy to do that. For a while we, uh, we landed at a little, it was a little village called Lassay. We patrolled the pipelines to keep the, the Frenchmen from breaking the pipeline and stealing the oil. And then we went up into Belgium and Holland to, the Germans occupied the Scheldt estuary and they had guns out on a peninsula. They could prevent the port of Antwerp from being used. So our job was to cut them off, which we did. And then we went back. Uh, we leave the first division at Aachen, which was the first city inside of Germany that was, that was taken. I remember pretty much rubble except for the cathedral. They purposely left the cathedral. It's a magnificent building. Let's see, November of 44, and then we were there uh, through Christmas. Let's see, we were on the, uh, the Roar River, R-O-E-R, -E Roar River and the Germans were right on the other side and we were camped on this side. Mm -hmm. And um, while we were there, of course, we could see the Germans at night. We could see them in, in the daytime. Um, uh, as a, I, was a, I was a scout. They always made the small guys the scouts, I suppose. They, <laughs> scout, yeah, scout does two things. He goes out on patrol and he he probes to see where the enemy is, and the main w reason you do that is, well, I think what he's referring to, I was the first scout of the first platoon of the first company of the first battalion of the first regiment of the first division of the whatever army it was. At one point, I was, I was the one nearest Berlin, as near as I could figure. Really? Yeah. yeah, I was way out in front. And uh, that was until a machine gun opened up and we all dove for a ditch. But <laughs> that was what was supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. This, this non-com who was not the sharpest knife in the drawer took, took me out to lay, to lay uh, trip wires with flares b between us and the, and, and the riverfront. And the Germans were riding the other side of the river. And we got them all set up, and then he managed to trip over the wire and set the flares off. <laughs> so there we were, <laughs> laying out. I said a few choice words, which that, along with my other big mouth, I was made and busted four times. I never did get beyond PFC, but that was all right. You want to talk about the other three times? <laughs> Can't remember. <laughs> Selective memory is good. Yeah. yeah. There was this, like a mountain, they had carved out a huge cavern in this mountain, originally probably to store oil and gasoline, but they were using it to build the, the V-2 rockets there. And they would work the people until they, they didn't feed them much, they didn't clothe them, and they died. They'd just shove them aside and put some more people in. I stayed in a hotel in, near Marble Arch, and there was a park there, and a, a buzz bomb, that was the, the, the area of the, the V-2 rockets, uh, landed right in the middle of the park, but it was a dud, and it just thumped into the ground. Then one day we came to a river, and on the other side of the river were the Russians. 45. Oh, well, we were, by that time, we had met the Russians and on the Elbe River. We'd gone all across Germany. We, we crossed several rivers and had several other 
battles and and uh, met the Russians and then of course we had to pull back because that later that area became the German so it must have been uh, must have been at some time there then when you met the Russians did you actually meet the Russians oh yeah we saw them yeah. they, they they were mostly drunk most of the time and they were fire they shoot their rifles off in the air and hoot and holler and you talked about terrible Terry Allen. Uh, did your paths cross with him at all? Not really. Uh, had very little to do with the top brass, actually. Well, given your given your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we were going to have a parade down in San Francisco uh, because our division was going to move to Can to San Luis Obispo and make the landings on Japan. But in the meantime, they had dropped the two big ones, and so. Uh, but I was the corner man on the of the whole formation, the the, the first the, the the right hand corner. So I was if I got out if I got off course, everybody else would too. So that's pressure. I must have been I must have been good for something. I don't know. <laughs> Everybody, everybody has a story. His is uh, quite interesting, and I was just thrilled. In fact, he was just. I uh, said, you know, given what you're, we're going to show today, you'll probably get some sort of Chautauqua medal just because of who you are. But he then recounted all the various uh, decorations and awards and medals that he got. And why don't you share those? Because that's an incredible sense of service that you did. So, well, the one I was most proud of was the combat infantry treatments badge. It's, uh, a wreath with a gun going across. You had a plain gun when you completed your... your. Then I, I got a bronze star. I got a European theater medal with three bell stars, good conduct medal, presidential unit citation with uh, a, a oak leaf, which meant we got it twice. And uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Well, we've remembered VJ Day and how much it meant to those waiting to go home and those waiting for them to return. And we've remembered the service of those who fought and won a war we had to fight and could not afford to lose. It is good for us to remember them, to take inspiration from their example, and to be reminded of what can be done, of what even we can do, when we are ready to sacrifice and work together for a common cause. The virtues demonstrated so dramatically in war are no less necessary in peace. But most of all, we need to remember those who never came home. We must not forget them, since their sacrifice reminds us of our duty to do what they could no longer do. We need to do this even still today. But we must ask a difficult question. Was their sacrifice really worth it? When we look at ourselves and our country today, our values, our morals and ideals, our quarrels and divisions, and our standing and reputation in the world, has their supreme sacrifice proven to be worth it? I do not know how they would answer, and I will not try to guess. What really counts is how we answer the question by what we do. It is not necessary, it's not enough to appreciate our freedom. What matters is what we do with it. Truly it is up to us, the living, as Lincoln said, to make certain their sacrifice was not in vain. Thank you.